Good evening. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Paris Alston. I am co-host of Morning Edition at GBH News, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this month's Beyond the Page and On to the Screen with Leon Moriarty. Now, in just a few minutes, we will be joined by Leon, who is a New York Times best-selling author with over 20 million copies of her books sold worldwide. Leon has written nine novels, including Big Little Lies and Nine Perfect Strangers, which were adapted into television series featuring award-winning actors, such as Nicole Kidman and Reese Witherspoon, folks we know and love. Her latest novel, Apples Never Fall, has also just been picked up for a limited series, which I'm sure we'll get into more about, more about that a little later. Leon began her career in advertising and marketing, eventually going on to run her own advertising agency. It was not until her younger sister's first young adult novel was being published, causing possibly a bit of a sibling rivalry, which we'll have to talk about that as well, for Leon to spring into action to write her own novel. Now, Leon lives in Sydney, Australia with her husband, son and daughter where she writes full-time and has become a global sensation, which is why we're all here tonight to be in conversation with her. Now, before I welcome Leon to the screen, I want to explain how this evening's event will work. We are using Zoom webinar, and I want you to pay close attention here because this is going to be how you answer questions, and if you're not familiar with it, you want to know all of this information. So as our audience, we cannot see or hear you, but we can feel you exuding through our computer screens here. And we're so happy to have you with us. And we want to hear from you all throughout the evening. You can ask questions during the course of this conversation by opening the Q&A tab, which is at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question there. I can see some of you have already been doing that. So kudos to you. You can also um, put your questions in at any point during this evening and time during our conversation, if someone says something or if Leon says something, or if you see a question um, that makes you think of something else, you can go ahead and type it in. And we will do our best to address as many questions as we can throughout the night. And because so many of you have so many common interests, like being all here to be in conversation with us tonight, you may be answer, asking some of the same questions as one of your neighbors here in Zoom. So if you see one that is similar to yours, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon in the Q&A tab and the most popular questions will rise to the top of the list so that we can work together as a group and conglomerate a little bit. Now to activate Zoom's automated captioning feature, all you have to do is select closed captioning, which is a button at the bottom of your screen, select live transcript, two transcription display options will pop up and we recommend that you can select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. And this will bring up a sidebar window where you can see what each speaker is saying. So either one of those options, just please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed on your end. And now that we have taken care of all that housekeeping, it is my wonderful pleasure to introduce our guest for this evening, Leon Moriarty. Leon, good evening. Good evening, guess, Paris. How I guess where you? you are, it is not evening. Is that right? <laughs> that that's right. It's good morning from from Sydney. Well, well, good morning, good evening. Thank you so much for being with us. It's really a pleasure to have you. Um, and I'm going to dive right into audience questions in just a second. I just want to start up with uh, a baseline question here because I understand that you are not the only writer in your family. Your your sisters, as we mentioned. Um, are, are, are also writers. So was that something, was writing and storytelling part of your upbringing? Uh, yes, it was. So I'm the eldest of six children. Uh, and when I was a little girl, I loved to write stories. And so did my next sister down, uh, and her name's Jackie. Uh, and when my father discovered that we liked writing stories, he actually commissioned us to write our very first uh, novels. So he paid a dollar for an exercise book uh, filled with words. Uh, but then as I grew up, uh, so when I was little, I just assumed that for sure I would be, um, you know, a, a writer one day in the same way that I assumed I could choose how many children I would one day <laughs> have or what, what I could call them. Uh, but then I, I lost that crazy confidence that I had as a little girl. Uh, so I wrote less and less. I wrote a few short stories, um, a few first chapters, 
Uh, as, I, uh, as you mentioned, I went into advertising and marketing, uh, but it wasn't until uh, Jackie uh, called me one day to say that her first novel, Feeling Sorry for Celia, had been accepted for publication. Uh, and I was, I love her dearly, so I was very happy for her. But at the same time, I was filled really with a sort of rage. And, and the rage was directed at myself because she'd gone ahead and achieved our childhood dream and I hadn't even tried. Mm. And so that inspired you to go ahead and try. That, absolutely. And she's, she's very nice. She always says she thinks that I would have done it one day anyway. Uh, but I honestly don't think I would have. I think I needed to see uh, that, that she'd done it. Uh, I think a lot of our authors say that, that it doesn't feel like a possibility until you see somebody that you know or somebody in your circle. I think there's often a ripple effect when somebody gets published that people in that circle think, oh, okay, real people do can write stories. Mm -hmm. And so now you're nine novels in. What is, uh, this is a question from Teresa who is in our audience. Hello, Teresa, thanks for your question. Uh, Teresa wants to know, what is the best piece of writing advice that you've received um, throughout your career that you still use in your own writing today? Uh, I think prob it's probably, I'll, I'll use a prop for this answer. Uh, so I have a- um, You brought props, oh my glass. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I think the right, the, um, the actual tip was to just write for a certain amount of time and don't think at all, don't um, put that critical voice, um, make, silence that. Uh, so don't think what, about what you're writing, think I'm just going to write rubbish for the next um, however long. Uh, and that, that somehow gets you going. So this is why I use this because it's, uh, I could use it. Obviously, you could use any. You could use your phone. But I like the fact that this is a beautiful old-fashioned hourglass. And I think it goes for half an hour. So if I'm stuck, I will often tell myself, okay, just, um, you know, do all the self-loathing talk. Yes, you're terrible. No, you can't do it. That's right. You're terrible. But okay, just write, just write, um, just write rubbish for the next half hour. And then you finally lose your sense of self and then the story starts to take over. If, if you promise to yourself you, you won't be criticising yourself as you write. Hmm. And that leads into a question that we have um, from Dana, who's in the audience. Dana, thank you for your question. Dana wants to know what your writing routine is. So it seems like this is part of your routine, right? When you, you hit a block, you, you use the hourglass. But what other parts of or what other elements are in your writing routine I mean is there something do you have a certain meal before you're like okay we're gonna go and start writing now do you do you go on a walk somewhere or do anything anything else special uh yes I always feel uh, I sometimes think I should make up a better answer to this question uh, because I love it when other authors have wonderful routines, you know, where they do eat a particular type of food or they, you know, they go for a walk uh, and then finally sit down and write. Um, but I have two, I have a 12 year old and a 14 year old. Uh, so I guess I do write when they're at school, but I, I do not have a rigid routine. So every day is different. Uh, the only thing I do is I, um, I do set myself a word count. So in the beginning of a, when I'm at the early stages of a novel, I do say I must write 500 words a day. Um, and then as the novel has momentum, then I'm happy to say, okay, uh, up to, ideally I should be writing around 1500 words a day. I think Stephen King says 2000 words a day, um, but whatever, whatever, um, you know, every author has something different, but for me, a word count, uh, and, and because I'm not, I'm not a planner, so that means my temptation is always to go back and edit what I've already done. So by setting a word count, that um, that keeps me keeps me going. But apart from that, and apart from my little hourglass, to if I'm going through the horrible self-loathing. Um, 
I don't really have a routine. I do at this, at whenever I'm starting a new novel, I buy a beautiful new notebook. I, I don't, oh, oh yes, oh no, I won't. I'll distract everybody by grabbing that <laughs> as a prop. Um, and I, I sometimes write notes in that. But to be honest, that's, that's just a little superstitious thing that I should buy the new notebook and I don't actually use it all that much. Uh, I ended up just at the computer uh, each day and, that, and that's, that's it. If I get stuck, yes, going for a walk uh, is a wonderful thing. Oh, that sounds nice. I am curious what the notebook looks like now. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll show you. <laughs> Here we go. It's this sort of, you know, those sort of beautiful. Oh, that's notebooks. beautiful. Yeah, I love, I love the notebook. It's real. But see, I can see there's hardly, there's nothing written in it. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> a couple of thoughts are on the way. So we have a number of questions from folks in the audience who are wondering um, about where the inspiration for your books come from. And I just, I want to, I'm scrolling through so I can give them a shout out. Um, at least one is asking, yeah, Lorraine uh, is asking, where do you get your storylines or from, are they from your life or from imagination? Um, another person is asking where, sorry, I'm losing. Oh yeah, Wendy is asking, is it everyday interactions or sometimes a spur of the thought for a story? So I'm just combining those two questions there. Um, yes, so the story ideas come from everywhere. So from um, my own life. So for example, uh, Truly Madly Guilty was inspired by something that happened to me at a barbecue. Uh, from things that I read. So uh, The Husband's Secret was inspired by an article that I read. Um, Apples Never Fall. Uh, I There were a, quite a few few sparks. One spark was a writing prompt that my sister sent me uh, describing because I was going to take a year off and I was thinking that I would um, just write short stories and I said send me a prompt for a short story and she sent me just a couple of lines describing some apples lying on the grass and a bike lying next to the apples and so that became my opening scene I never wrote the short story uh, so that became the opening scene for apples never fall so um, but also apples never fall was inspired I'm pretty sure by true crime podcasts because like uh, joy in the book my husband gave me some fancy wireless headphones and I got into podcasts um, so yes just everywhere uh, and yet yeah, once once you're writing something, once you start following a direction, then it seems like every single event that I go to, every conversation, then I'm getting little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. And do you, we have a question from, from someone who's asking, um, and I'll find their name as I'm asking this, but do you know the ending of a story as it is un when you begin writing or, or does that unfold throughout the process? If for me, I prefer not to know the ending. So it means I um, <clears throat> can sit down at my desk each day and think I wonder what's going to happen today. Uh, but it's also a scary way to write because I have to think I hope something happens today. Uh, and so I can always remember the exact intersection where I was when I worked out how the different storylines of The Husband's Secret all came together. So not every author likes to write that way. So um, my sister, I talk about my sister a lot. Um, so Jackie, she prefers to plan. She does have those beautiful notebooks. So I think this is probably why I uh, started buying them because she buys them and she really does fill them all with words and she uses colour highlighters and she has it all planned out. But I can't, I can't do it. I seem to need to start to just start writing and then see, see where it takes me. Um, so with Apples Never Fall, I had my premise, which was that a woman uh, goes missing and the, her adult children have to deal with the possibility that maybe their husband, their father um, may be responsible. But I did not know if he was guilty or 
innocent at the start of the novel. So I just start the family starting to come together and the whole way through I'm thinking, is he innocent? Is he guilty? Um, and, uh, and But I also, especially for any uh, aspiring writers who are, are listening, I never want to give the impression that it all just falls completely into place writing in that way. Uh, it means that as I'm working it out, I'm then thinking, okay, so now I will have to go back and fix things uh, as the jigsaw pieces are, are coming together. So, for example, in Apples Never Fall, I, um, it became important that the character of Stan did not own a cell phone. Uh, so I can remember writing uh, in my, I have a document called Things I Need to Fix, which I uh, keep. Uh, and so the very first thing was take Stan's cell phone away because in the I'd written in the first chapter, he was in his bed scrolling through his phone. Um, so about two thirds of the way through, I finally, I know where I'm going. And it is a glorious relief when I know how it's going to end. Uh, but I can't, I and I, yeah, I don't know if I ever will write a book where I know at the beginning uh, how how it will all come together. Mm -hmm. Nice to keep the the suspense as some inspiration there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned how some of how many of your stories, many of the inspiration for your stories come from real life experiences. Uh, we have a couple of folks in the audience who are wondering about the characters and if there's any real life for inspiration inspiration for them as well. Um, oh, and I just want to go back and say thanks to Madeline for the question about uh, the process and whether you start at the ending or not. Um, so Linda is asking, you know, what double checks do you do to keep your characters real? And Kathy is asking if any of those characters are based on real life people. So my characters are never entirely based on uh, real people. So I have never helped myself to a complete personality. Uh, but I will confess that I have sometimes taken attributes of people I know. Um, so when you were mentioning Madeline, uh, the questioner, I was thinking of Madeline, my character, uh, because I can always remember writing down um, perpetually outraged. So this is an attribute like so-and-so. And then I can remember writing shimmery, shimmery girl, like so-and-so. So I had these two attributes uh, and I normally just start writing the character in the same way that I, I don't, um, my plots are not planned. I'm also not one of those authors like JK Rowling who um, apparently Harry Potter came to her fully formed. My characters, I seem to need them to come to life just by writing them. So it means in the beginning of a book, I'm always, I um, really miss my characters from my previous book. So right now I'm missing the Delaney's from Apples Never Fall because my new characters don't feel real to me. Um, but I just start writing them. And as I say, I will often have some a couple of attributes from real people. And then through the process of writing, they somehow come to life. So the character of Madeline in Big Little Lies was nothing like my perpetually outraged friend or the shimmery friend, but their two attributes somehow helped create, create her. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that in addition to drawing on real life experiences and, and, and encounters, you have to do a, a good amount of research too to make sure that the story is authentic and, and accurate. And Linda is asking, you know, many times with that research, um, it, there's all kinds of stuff that comes up, but from which of your books did you learn the most and what was the topic that you were researching? Oh, thank you, Linda. That's an interesting question, which I will probably come up with a better answer. I, I'll change my mind later when I think about this. Uh, which one did I? Um, so Truly Madly Guilty has a cellist uh, as a character and I, um, I know nothing, well, I know nothing about so many subjects. Um, but So I had to, um, I spoke to a wonderful um, cellist for the Sydney Symphony Orchestra uh, and went to see her perform and went into the green room uh, afterwards and, 
and so that was a whole a whole world that I knew nothing nothing about um I'm trying to think of other it prob that probably is the correct answer that um and but now I've forgotten all of it of course I try to collect information um and and then it's like it's like the way I was at school when I'd you know you'd learn everything and then I'd give it in the exam and then I'd wipe my mind clear afterwards which is not the way to learn um and I learned a lot about tennis for for this for this book um but I must admit I don't I don't like having I, I because I feel frustrated with myself because I know if I really was a cellist then I would be able to do a much better job so I'm, I always wish uh, that I'd led a hundred different lives so that then I could I could write authentically about uh, um, yeah so many about different careers and lifetimes. So we have a bunch of questions about the, the television and film adaptations of your books, right? Um, and this is, is, is really the ringing meaning to the, the title of our discussion here, Beyond the Page and Onto the Screen. Um, I kind of, I'm, I'm gonna get to the audience questions, but I'm curious if, I mean, I, I guess I wonder if authors um, kind of write their books with this, this, this dream or this, this desire to have them adapted um, was that true for you or, or was it kind of a surprise for that opportunity to come out of your writing? Uh, I definitely have never written a book um, thinking of it, thinking of the potential adaptation, um, especially because I have so many, my characters have so many internal monologues. Uh, I can always remember reading uh, an article where uh, something about Nine Perfect Strangers, where it said she she wrote it with one eye on the potential adaptation, uh, and I always think that I had those characters in the book. Uh, for many days, it's um, they're doing a silent meditation, so there is not a word of dialogue for pages on end. So I'm really, um, I really don't. Um, I, I'm not thinking of a future adaptation for me. The book is the end goal but of course having said that having an adaptation is something that um, is wonderful for any author because uh, it's a thrill uh, and it brings you so many more readers um, that, who, would, who would never otherwise have known of your work uh, and for me uh, Big Little, the adaptation of Big Little Lies was just such a pleasure from start to finish um, just the fun of it. So again, um, you know, so probably in answer to that previous question, that's the world of which, of which I um, knew nothing about. Um, um, uh, coming, so getting to visit uh, the, a film set and that sort of thing and seeing the way actors work um, was, it felt to me like a wonderful perk of the job. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And I just want to give a shout out to, to Mariana who essentially at, was leading us and you you answered Mariana's question without us explicitly asking but they were asking about if you do keep that in mind um but I know we have um some audience members who are wondering such as Dorothy here how how much control or input do you have um on the film or television adaptation of your stories so I was asked with Big Little Lies if I wanted to write the, um, the screenplay. But for me, because as I said, I part of the pleasure in writing for me is seeing what happens. So for me, writing uh, an adaptation of my own work uh, gives me no pleasure because I already know what happened. Uh, so I actually I had no desire um, to to do so uh, and also I think writing for um, for television or for film is a, a completely different medium and I do think there have to be changes for um, to suit that medium uh, and so I know some people 
often say to me, they say, I hope they, I hope they don't change your book. Um, and I say, but nobody can, nobody can change my book. Nobody can um, change your experience of, of reading it. The, book, the book's there. So I've always accepted that um, changes need to happen for an adaptation. Uh, and so I've, I've been very hands-off. So I've, uh, and for me, uh, that helps because I think if I did try to become too involved, then I think I would, I would hold on too tightly. And um, I can I can remember seeing the scene where uh, Madeline trips in Big Little Lies and uh, hurts her ankle, and I'm I always roll my ankles myself. So in my mind, I have a very particular way that the ankle her ankle should have flipped to the side um, and Reese tripped in a different way. So, uh, but it's of no consequence. Um, it, that's just her, at a, uh, you know, her, you know, maybe she's tripped in, in that particular way. But that's why I think if I started to say, okay, you've got to flip in this, in this way, what, I, that really doesn't matter. I'd rather step back and enjoy enjoy watching it and and I always find it interesting because I think every single reader has a different uh interpretation and experience of reading the book because they bring their all their own experiences so every reader would have in their own mind seen a different way of the ankle so all those who whose ankles flip in that excruciating way that mine do would have seen it that way <laughs> but everybody you know and every every actor um which was so interesting to me when they were interpreting the char characters they brought so many things from their own life to it um but yeah as I say I prefer to be a very interested bystander so we have a question from Janet who's saying hi to us from Kate Cod um and also that she loves your writing and Janet wants to know what's your personal favorite of your nine novels? And I want to add to that, what is your personal favorite adaptation of your novels? <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Janet, first of all. Uh, and it's really hard for me to say a favorite. I, I guess I always hope that the most recent novel, it probably feels like my favorite. And I always hope this is not the case. I it's, I can't. Um, this will never be. But I I always want people to say that my most recent novel was their favourite because then it feels like I'm on an upward trajectory rather than um you know if they say my novel four or five novels back was their favourite. Uh, so I yeah I really don't I don't have um I don't have a favourite. Um, Sometimes I, I have favorite, I, I love Napoleon, favorite characters. So Napoleon in Nine Perfect Strangers um, and Vid in Truly Madly Guilty uh, and Gemma in Three Wishes. So some those characters feel very special to me. But I don't, I don't have a favorite book. And I've only had two adaptations and I loved both of them. Um, and that they were both, they were quite different. Um, so no, I couldn't, I'm sorry, I couldn't pick a favorite either. That's fair, that's fair. I mean, so you do have a third on the way with Apples Never Fall. Um, and, and, and Josh, who's on our team here at GBH is curious, who would be your dream cast for that adaptation? I don't, I don't believe it's been casted yet because it was just picked up, but if you could choose the, the folks <laughs> to fill those roles, who would they be? Um, yes, yeah, so I've been asked that, but I actually, um, and I remember when I finished writing Nine Perfect Strangers, uh, even though I didn't have my eye on the television, when I finished it and when it was a possibility, uh, and I can remember thinking that um, Melissa McCarthy was definitely my um, first choice for, for Frances and I was so thrilled that she agreed, um, she agreed to do it. But for Apples Never Fall, I don't, I have not got... Um, anybody in particular in mind uh, except that I did mention to uh, David Heyman is the um, the producer who he produced um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and um, the Harry Potter films and I did say just casually mention to him that uh, Bradley Cooper is apparently a very good tennis player just just for interest uh, but apart from that I, I really I don't have 
I'm, I'm interested to see. And, uh, and in a way, it would be wonderful to have um, uh, unknown actors too, not to not necessarily have um, big names for the roles. Mm -hmm. And you talked a little bit about how, I mean, and aside from the casting, um, but also, you know, small things that change from when your stories go from the page to the screen. Um, LWV Needham is asking how you feel about things like the settings changes. So for instance, with, the, with Big Little Lies uh, being set in Monterey, California, instead of Australia. Um, well, but, um, I, I think it was a, it was still a beachside town. I don't know how I would have felt if it was set in the, um, you know, the Alps. Um, so I appreciated the fact that it, um, it was still felt to me very familiar. Um, and I loved the adaptation. But of course, I, I would, I would love to see an Australian adaptation of my work. Um, one day uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we are slowly running out of time. I know um, the GBH team will tell me exactly how much time we'll, we have left here, but we have a number of questions from the audience um, revolving around two things. One, what are you working on right now? And also, what are you reading or, or who are some other authors in addition to Jackie who you are inspired by? <laughs> Uh, so right now um, I'm in the very early stages of a new novel. Um, so I'm actually, um, uh, and so I won't say much about what it's what it's about because I'm in the flailing about. I don't know if it's going to work. Um, sort of loathing having to use my my hourglass a lot to try and get to get the momentum of the story going. Um, but I am reading some nonfiction. Um, in research for that, um, but I won't say what the nonfiction is, except that it, um, it's probably a little bit over my head. I'm not sure if I can <laughs> I can pull it off. Uh, the a book I fiction book that I read recently that I loved was called Looking. It was called Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie. I think I've, I might have lost her name, but Lessons in Chemistry is a book that um, that I recently I really loved. That's wonderful. Well, we will be waiting on the edge of our seats here. Um, so we're going to take a little bit of a break here. I'm going to pass to my colleague, Jamie, who has a special um, offer for all of us. And then we will come back and continue this wonderful conversation. Hello again, everybody. Hopefully now I can be seen and heard. Um, hello, friends. Thanks so much for joining us during tonight's extra special Beyond the Page featuring best-selling novelist, Leon Moriarty. You know, GBH members are critical to helping GBH provide a valuable community service, which is offering news, arts, and cultural enrichment for free to everyone. If you enjoy free virtual events like tonight's Beyond the Page, well, please consider uh, contributing to this cause. Tonight, if you support GBH by giving $5 a month as a GBH sustainer, that's only $60 a year. We will send you a signed copy of Leon's latest novel, Apples Never Fall. Apples Never Fall delves into the complicated life of the Delaney's, an Australian family of six who appear to be living the picture perfect life until the mother, Joy, goes missing. This novel looks at marriage, siblings, and how the people we love the most can often hurt us the deepest. Now giving to GBH is simple. Just click on the link you see in our Zoom chat now to be brought to a secure donation page at gbh.org slash support events. It should only take a few minutes of your time. If you're already a member, thanks so much for your support. And if you wish to become one, and tonight is a special gift, receive that signed copy of Apples Never Fall by Leon Moriarty. Um, just click on that chat link you see and make a donation. Do not miss out on this special offer. I promise once you start reading this book, you will not want to put it down. 
you know, audience support enables GBH to keep going and growing. Without you, we simply would not be operating. With that said, I'm going to toss it back to Paris and Leon for the conclusion of tonight's event and to our audience at home, happy reading until we see you next time. Jamie, thank you so much for that. And, and really, I just want to underscore, we really appreciate everything um, that you, our supporters, do to help us at GBH continue to do the work and bring in conversations like this. So Leon, I want to do sort of a deep dive into characters here because there are a lot of questions in the audience about um, your characters and how they're developed. And I, I know we talked a little bit about this earlier. So Aaron, who is in our audience says, I really love all of your characters. One that sticks out to me is Margie's husband in the last anniversary. How do you write men so well? Wow, oh my goodness. <laughs> that is like a mind blowing question right there. Do you find they are not so different from writing women or are they very different? Um, well, firstly, thank you so much. I, um, Cause the last anniversary, uh, I think I wrote that nearly to, um, nearly 20 years ago. And um, so it, feel, it feels like, um, so I, I always think when I think back to Margie, um, in my mind, I pronounced it Margie, um, but a lot of people say Margie. Um, and she was a character, she was in her 50s. And so I think I was in her, my 30s when I wrote it. And when I look back now, I think oh, I made a feel, now I'm, I'm in my 50s. So now I feel like I've, I've made a feel, she sound, felt too old to me. Um, and that character, Ron, he was horrible, wasn't he? Uh, and I, I, I expect he was probably slightly inspired um, by a recent ex-boyfriend at the time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I always think that my female characters are my strength because I, um, you know, grew up in a family with um, four sisters, uh, went to an all-girls uh, school, uh, and I'm sort of a girl's girl um, and the person I'm, I'm probably too shy around around men. So I've, I felt with my, um, I've made an effort actually with my recent books to make sure that my male characters have as much depth as my, as my female characters. Uh, and, but in answer to how do I do it, it's really just observing and just working on that that character uh, and as I said earlier sometimes taking little things from other people but then uh, so, so something a tiny bit magical happens and then they come come to life and they feel very real to me. We also have a question from Elizabeth who says I put you and Ann Tyler at the top of the list of writers who capture true life and therefore hilarious dialogue between husbands and wives. Where do you think that talent comes from? Um, I can't concentrate on the on the question because I'm so thrilled to um, be described in the same sentence as um, <laughs> <laughs> as Anne Tyler, who's uh, my favorite author. Um, my uh, my editor gave me uh, the best present I have ever received, which I always say I would um, save in a fire is a signed. Uh, edition of um, signed first edition of the accidental um, tourist. Uh, I was joking in the beginning that I couldn't focus on the question, but now I honestly have forgotten the, the question uh, in my. Um, oh, so dialogue was it dialogue? It was yes. How where do you get the talent to to capture dialogue between husbands and wives so well? <laughs> I don't. It's just. It's just. Um, just listening, uh, and and I I guess I enjoy that. So I find it, I find that easy, the easy part of the writing. I find um, describing a landscape very difficult. I have no ability to do that, or even describing furniture and things like that. But the dialogue, um, I, I just enjoy writing. The only thing I, I would say, speaking of Anne Tyler, is that if um, I've recently read an Anne Tyler book then I'm too influenced by her and my characters all start to sound like they come from Baltimore rather than um, 
from <laughs> Sydney. Um, so I have to deliberately um, say you stop um, trying to be Anne Tyler. And the other thing she does is she uses italics so beautifully so that, that a character emphasising a particular word in a, in a sentence. So, again, I start I overuse italics if I'm trying too much to be like Anne Tyler. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned Ann Tyler was your favorite author, and we have some, I know we talked a little bit before the break about things that you're reading and working on, but we had some folks who wanted um, a reiteration of, of authors you like to read. So in addition to Ann Tyler, who else uh, is an inspiration for you, or even just an author you read in your free time? Um, yes, yeah, so Ann, Ann Tyler is always at the, at the top of the list, uh, and this is when I always start to um, worry because I have friends who are authors and authors who I think afterwards uh, um, I should have mentioned um, to so there are my two sisters who are Jacqueline Moriarty and Nicola Moriarty uh, wonderful authors um, two other friends are Marion Keys and Jojo Moyes um, who are wonderful authors Maggie O'Farrell Kate Atkinson a lot of a lot of female um, authors Tessa Hadley there so that's um uh, quite a few British authors that I enjoy um and now I'm looking around my <laughs> my <laughs> my to think who who I've who I've missed um Alice Munro of course um Zadie Smith. I'm just looking. I'm, I'm starting to to read the books on my bookshelf. Now. <laughs> yeah, just list all of them off. <laughs> yes. yes, that's right. Just zoom in, and you'll see. <laughs> yes, yes. Um. So, speaking back to to your characters and their development, we have a question from Wendy, uh, who's asking: Of all the characters you've created, do you have a favorite? Someone maybe who you would have liked to have met in real life. Um. And Lydia is also asking. You know, which which of those characters would you like to have lunch with or live next to? <laughs> that's a, that's a very nice question. Uh, let me think. Who would I like to have lunch with? Probably uh, Vid in Truly Madly Guilty, who is uh, um, a Slovenian electrician uh, and one of those um, very um outgoing European men who um, loves people uh and so you know those sort of people who if you go to a social event they're just uh, very stimulating and outgoing and make you feel so welcome um yeah pro probably probably vid but I think maybe my char favorite character is Napoleon um from uh Nine Perfect strangers um who's just one of uh, who's very tall uncool um but a really good person uh is the way the way i see him so jeanette has a question uh for all the fans of the husband secret I've, I've seen a number of people giving some love to that one jeanette wants to know if you had found the letter would you have opened it <laughs> I absolutely would have opened it. Um, so I have often, when um, you know, I was doing events where I was talking about that novel, I would um, ask that question, um, and who in the audience would open it? Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's mostly unanimous. Uh, <laughs> so you know, my husband has always said, um, uh, "I know you would open." that letter and that's why I would never write such a such a letter so no I could not sadly I could not resist <laughs> and, of, and of course in the book she had to open it because otherwise there would be no story yeah absolutely um and that also it's just human nature right to, to want to satisfy <laughs> some of those I, I think so I, <laughs> there are probably some strong-minded people who would not who would not do it but um no I'd have to open it <laughs> mm -hmm. so to that point um Marie is saying a lot of your books deal with the human condition do you at times decide to pursue certain themes or human conditions because of the current events um, or experiences or is it just something that comes together on its own yeah, I never, <clears throat> I never um, 
sit down and think I'm going to explore this particular theme um, or, or that I want to make this particular point. For me, it's always just, uh, it's about story. And so what intrigues me and um, as, as, so I normally have a premise of some sort. Uh, and then the themes emerge as I, as I write. Um, but I, I never, <clears throat> I'm always conscious of not um, preaching a particular point that I, I don't think I, uh, I think that's important not to do that. Um, but I, I know certain themes probably I keep coming back to accidentally, uh, but I, um, I think um, uh, it's Anne Patchett who said um, every author, something about um, every author's writing the same book over over and over again um, and so I can understand yeah, that people see similar themes um, probably about guilt and um, redemption and things like that I think I keep coming back to um, which is probably uh, as a result of the, um, being a going to a Catholic school um, uh, so that seems to keep coming into it that lapsed Catholic even though I'm a lapsed Catholic I'm still um, I still feel very guilty <laughs> <laughs> you and me both <laughs> I did not grow up Catholic I feel guilty too <laughs> oh, do you? And maybe it's just part of being a woman that we're all yeah. constantly guilty <laughs> uh, yeah I think that definitely has has something to do with it for sure um so Penny has an interesting question here Penny's asking how do you decide which characters actually narrate the story we learn about them through their inner thoughts their motives etc as well as dialogue and then some characters we learn about only through their interactions with others in dialogue, such as Stan and Apple's Never Fall, for instance. Um, is that something that's planned or also something that develops over the course of your writing? Uh, it definitely develops over the course of the book. I know that I always uh, set out each time I write a new book and I think this time I'm only going to write from one character's perspective because I do um, often write from multiple characters uh, and I can never seem to do it because I do love uh, learning what goes on in a character's head uh, and so no matter how hard I try um, because I know as a reader sometimes I think uh, I'm enjoying a particular character and then I turn the page and then you're in another character's head and I think oh no I, I wish I could have stayed with that one character and I love books where you do st um, stay with the one um, the one character but I can't seem to do it myself and to be honest with Stan I probably would have jumped into his head too except then we would have known if he was um, innocent or guilty so that's probably the only reason I held off being um, writing from his perspective right until until the end. Mm -hmm. Nancy is saying, I noticed that a lot of your stories are based on flashbacks, which seems to be a popular writing style right now. Um, and she's invoking Kate Atkinson, other authors. Will you continue with the style or do you think it's run its course for you? And I'm also gonna add a question from Linda who is asking about the method for jumping back and forth in time. Um, I'd like, has it run its course? I don't, um, the, the, if, if the book I'm writing at the moment, oh, no a problem. <laughs> it often, I was just thinking that, um, in the, with this, this next book um, that I, I can just write in a, a linear fashion, but no, I actually, I won't be able to. I don't know, sometimes the story just seems to, um, to end that way, but, um, and it would be easier from a logistical point of view if I could just write a story that starts here and ends ends on the the last page. Um, and it's always tricky when you're creating suspense. Um, so it's it's always this really hard balance that I'm trying to achieve um, between ma maintaining suspense and not annoying the the reader uh, so I think some some readers felt that with truly madly guilty I, I took too long to tell them what happened at the barbecue 
Um, but then the trick, the tricky part is once they know what happens at the barbecue, have they lost interest in the book? So that's where I'm always, I'm always struggling with. Uh, so for me, I would, it's always just story and then the, the structure. Um, sometimes I feel it's forced upon, it's almost forced upon me um, that, as I say, I wish I could just have a really simple uh, structure. Um, so sorry, I'm, I'm struggling with answering that question because it's something I struggle with uh, in each new novel. No, that makes sense. Thanks so much for, for sharing that part of our, your process with us. Mm -hmm. Um, Kathy is asking, we have two folks asking questions about how it was for you writing during the pandemic. So Kathy's saying, did you feel that COVID or that time in quarantine impacted your creativity or helped it? And we also have a question from Kathleen who's asking um, specifically about Apples Never Fall and how it happens in part during the worst of the pandemic and then again, generally how the pandemic affected your life while writing. Um, so the first part of the pandemic, um, I'd lost my dad just before we all went into lockdown. So we were very lucky to be able to, to have a funeral. Um, so a few, just I think a week or so later, we wouldn't have um, had, you know, a big, wonderful funeral. Um, and so when I look back on that time, you know, when you lose somebody close to you, you know, that line about wanting the clocks to stop, it felt like the clocks did stop. So in a way, it was um, it was quite lovely to be able to grieve in that way and not to be expected to to go anywhere. Um, and so it was a very peaceful time. Um, I always feel you are, of course, you always need to say, if you say anything positive about the pandemic, you always feel the need to say, of course, I would rather we didn't have the worldwide suffering. Um, uh, but from a writing point of view, I know some authors said that they just could not write during that um, time. Uh, but for me, I was lucky in that Apples Never Fall, I was at that really good point in the novel where it had momentum. Uh, so I found, I really appreciated that time that I had, I felt like I had far more time. Um, my children, uh, they were, you know, I think with littler children, it would have been harder. And with older children, it would have been harder. I felt my children were at a good age <clears throat> um, with their online learning. And so I wrote really well um, during those, those early months of the pandemic. Um, and then the next part of the question, was it about the pandemic finding its way into the novel? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which was not something that I set out to do because I'd written so much of it before it, but because of that structure, and again, that goes back to um, that previous question where I was going back and forth between the two different times, and as, as I came towards the end of the novel, I suddenly realised, okay, well, now here we are, and actually the pandemic would be starting, this, um, and so it just seemed to make sense to bring that in um so yeah, yeah but i i didn't i didn't start out thinking I, I would write about that in fact i was thinking i, I won't mention it at all mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i think creatively if we look at all the, the stuff that was created in that time a lot of folks were trying to figure out how to integrate it or not um and leanna i, I, I was very sorry to hear about the loss of your father and thank you for sharing that with us if I may, may I ask you a question about him? Um, did he have an impact on on your writing, and and how did he influence you? Uh, well, definitely from the point of view that he um, commissioning our first stories, so he took full credit for um, the success of his daughters, um, <clears throat> and he was he was very proud. He wasn't. Um, he wasn't really, oh, well, he did, he used to, he, when he was younger, he used to read because he had a, a lot of um, sort of airport thrillers in his, um, I can remember, in his office. So I did used to, when I was far too young, read books that um, I should not have been, you know, sort of racy thrillers. Um, so in that way, he influenced me. Uh, but otherwise, really, probably just his pride in um, when he was in hospital in those final uh, days, he had a, a laminated photo that had a picture of me as a little girl um, 
with a little notebook writing um, on the front porch. And on the back of it, he had um, a picture of me with Meryl Streep uh, that he'd got laminated. Uh, so the laminating in um, Apples Never Fall um, you know, was definitely influenced uh, by Dad. So he was, I can remember him showing that um, picture to, to many of the, the nurses. That is delightful, Leon. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, thank um, you. Of course. Mary from Natick uh, has a question that is related to that, asking about what your favorite books were as a child. So my favorite books were um, the Enid Blyton books, which I don't, um, I, I realized when I did my, um, started doing book tours in the U.S., I don't think Ina Blyton was as big a writer in the US as in the UK and Australia, um, but she was the famous five and the secret seven. Um, uh, so I was very influenced um, by her um, because I can, when I look back at those stories that I wrote for my dad, those characters sound suspiciously British. They don't sound... Um, like a little Australian girl. They all seem to be speaking with English accents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Heather, who is with us this evening, is asking, do you ever go back and make major changes to themes or the endings of a book after others read your unfinished manuscripts? Um, I've, never, I've never had to make a major change um no I um I, I really value the editing process and so I, I make a a lot of small significant changes but I've never I've been lucky that I haven't had to make a really huge change um so, so um, yeah as I say I'm really grateful for my editors because um I can always remember reading uh, read a review of the hypnotist love story saying um, oh, I didn't understand this character but then I really got to know this character's motivation or something like that and I can remember thinking well thank goodness my editor told me you need to make that particular character's motivations clearer so it's lots of things like that um, that I go back and change but I've, I've so far um, and now I need to touch wood I haven't had to really um, do a massive change to a, to a novel. Um, and our last question here, because Leon, I know you have to, to head out here um, and start your day, right? And get on into your day while we're ending <laughs> our breakfast. Yes, we have a question from Sherry, uh, who simply asks, have you ever played tennis in regards to Apple's Double Fall? <laughs> Yes, so I uh, was not a competitive tennis player, <clears throat> but definitely a social player. And my son has been playing tennis and got quite good. So I was actually having a tennis lesson, um, trying to keep up with my son. And that's when I, and while I was having that lesson, I was thinking about this novel and I was thinking about how I wanted my family to run a family business which was really just so I could keep all my characters in one place. Um, so in the same way with Nine Perfect Strangers, where I kept put them, sent them all off to a health resort and took away their phones. Um, it's just helpful in the, you know, in the same way Agatha Christie did put them all on a on an island somewhere. Um, so I was thinking, I, I want a family business um, so that they don't, my characters don't have to keep going off to a, work each day which is annoying um, and so then I as I had this lesson I thought oh no I'll make a, a tennis school um, and it was interesting because in my mind I was thinking okay good it's a tennis school but then as I the days went by and I was writing the story then I started to think well I guess if um, they run a tennis school they're really into tennis um, so I'm obviously going to have to you know and maybe therefore they used to be competitive players so then I thought, now I'm going to have to talk to tennis players. And that's when talking to tennis players, uh, and it was one particular player who was a young man who'd given up his uh, tennis career. Uh, and just the way he spoke about it and how he was really grieving for that about that decision 
uh, that really struck me and that's what got me thinking so what happens if you have the talent and you have the drive and you put in all those hours but you don't make it um, which is of course is the case for 90 I, I don't know the percentage but probably 99 percent of um of players so that then tennis then came to drive the story but no my tennis um, my, my coach that tennis coach was very happy when I just stopped he stopped trying to fix up I've got a problem with my ball toss I can't get the. I get too nervous and um, the, it goes off on a weird angle so he was very happy to then just spend a lot of time at the net talking about tennis rather than trying to teach me how to play it Oh, hey, even if you're not playing, maybe maybe Bradley Cooper can end up <laughs> playing as Logan. Someone said he would make a great Logan. So we'll keep okay, yeah, Exactly. That's um, whoever said that. That's exactly right. That's who I was. Um, wouldn't he be a great Logan? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Leon, this has really, truly been a pleasure and an honor. Um, thank you so much for your time, for all your insights and for, for answering all of our audience questions and being here with us. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Paris. And thank you so much to everybody for those, for those lovely questions and comments. Thank you. And I want to say thank you all so much for tuning in to this evening's Beyond the Page. We have really enjoyed it. Your questions helped make this an incredible event. So I thank you. And now I'm going to turn it back to, uh, to Josh. Actually, no, we're, I'm going to end it, actually. <laughs> So we hope everyone had an amazing evening uh, and stay tuned to hear who is next month author uh, and who or who it may be. Good night. Thank you.